It was snowing softly, settling in fluffy flakes on the trees. Winter in Utah can be frosty. But not in Salt Lake City. Here, the thermometer rarely dips below minus 5, but it snows every winter, even if it doesn't last long. At 6 o'clock in the evening, a car pulled up to the house. To tell the truth, today, I was not waiting for anyone and wanted to rest a little, to be lazy to watch something on the box for idiots and drink beer. The guests rolled up the Valley City side of my open parking lot behind the house and turned off the engine. I looked out the kitchen window, a Chevy Silverado, so the father-in-law had arrived. Or rather ex-father-in-law. I turned on the coffee maker and went to greet the visitor wondering what he needed from me on this winter evening. I even wondered if something was wrong with Doris. Maybe she's sick. No. She wasn't, it was Doris herself. Doris de Adrian, my ex. Shit. It's been six months, opening the door and seeing my Doris. Fuck. My what? It hasn't been my for six months now, still. It was good to see her, honestly, we hugged, and I helped her take off her coat, shaking the snow off. Should I say I was burningly curious about the purpose of her visit? No. I can't say that, she came to visit. Thank you. What's the big deal? Dory didn't like coffee, it ruined the color of her teeth. And she's my goddammit. Not again. Oh, come on, she hasn't been at my place for a long time. Anyway, Doris is an orthopedic dentist, and she knows better than anyone I know how to take care of my teeth. I poured orange juice into a glass and set it on the living room table. Then I added plates of croissants and vanilla donuts. They looked around the living room and probably noticed that nothing had changed since she left. She settled into her chair by the table and sat watching me fidget and smiling. We chatted about the weather, my parents' health, her health and a lot of other, nothing, and I kept waiting for her to finally get to the purpose of her visit. She didn't come to ask about my health, to tell you the truth after she left, I kept thinking she'd try to get back at me, maybe even shoot me or something, but today, if that's what she wanted, she would have killed me as soon as I opened the door. No. She sat there smiling genuinely, looking me in the face. No aggression whatsoever. I know how to spot that. Well, let's spend some time enjoying each other's company, we've been married almost five years. It's been a good life. I can't complain, we've had our moments, but show me a family that doesn't have them. We had this house, it was a nice little house, I'd say. Brick with an open parking lot in the backyard, it keeps well cool in the heat of the summer and warm in the short winter, it has two bedrooms in the attic a spacious living room, and a large basement where a small gym is set up. It's a small plot of land, a quarter of an acre, but we weren't going to plant maize. In this house, we were quite comfortable. We settled in and had guests over, we lived in it, loved it, and enjoyed it. This lodge is a departmental lodge, it belongs to Brinks, and we lived in it without any concern for rent. I had a contract with Brinks, and if I worked there for twenty years, I would automatically own the house. Besides, as a veteran who was in a hotspot and was wounded, I pay half of the utilities, the state adds the rest. Last year, I changed the soft roof to a metal roof and painted the roof a dark pale pale color, practical and beautiful, the old one looked quite unpresentable, and this year, I planned to plaster the plinth and painted beige, but it turned out the way it did. Doris put the glass on the table inside. You're probably wondering why I'm here. Dory Dory. Why did you do that? I'm curious about what you came to see me about, but you didn't come. I'm glad you're here, honestly. You know, I've been seeing Noah Foster. I gasped. Dory, are you crazy? He's a married man and he's ten years older than you. Doris got mad. Harris, he and I just happened to meet and talk there's no need to get your hopes up. He told me everything. I'm sorry, Dory. I thought I said embarrassed. You thought I was a whore, did you? Dory looked me in the eye with defiance. Well, I'm sorry, Dore. I really blurted out the wrong thing. So what did you talk to my boss about, 
The ex leaned back in her chair and looked at me sadly for a while. He told me the whole story. She continued and explained that you had to do so. The way you did you had to kill him by duty. There was a command investigation. The board reviewed the testimony of the passengers and the stewardess. They reviewed the video footage and concluded that you had to use a weapon. Noah told me everything, I and that's why I forgive you. I I forgive I grinned, sadly. What's so funny? Doris got mad. Well, if you forgive me, then Noah didn't tell you everything. And everything started with it started with an ordinary magnetic key. The blue key chain key Doris had on her necklace. When I asked her what this beautiful key was, she was a little embarrassed and told me a story about a new lock on the entrance to the salt dental wing. It was a lie because I stopped by their hospital on 1000 North Street yesterday. I wanted to sit with my wife at a coffee shop, have lunch, and talk about my new assignment. It'll probably mean I'll have to be out of the house a little more, but it'll be a raise of almost 25,000 annualized, of course. At the time, your humble servant's annual salary was $72,000 plus an army disability pension of $32,000. All right. 31,800 greenbacks. I didn't lie that much. Maybe a 100 pounds isn't that much, but me and my family now have lifetime health insurance. Lifetime service at a military commissary that sells the same stuff as regular stores, but at a 50% discount. Oh, yeah. I almost forgot. And gasoline at military gas stations for my wife and me at a 50% discount too. Oh, no. 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 I wasn't a badass Navy SEAL or a thug paratrooper. In Iraq, I had a quiet, humble profession as a scout sniper, that's where I got hit by a mortar shell near. I was lucky to survive. And now I only have slight limp on my left leg, but I can boast a Congressional Medal of Honor. That's not really relevant? No. It's not. Yes. It is. I came home from the war in 10 after being discharged from the war. I was 25 at the time. A month later, I met Doris Day, a quiet pretty girl fresh out of dental school after medical school at a veteran's benefit. Her father, a sports doctor, had convinced her to choose this particular profession. She agreed and did not miss out. I also had the opportunity to get a higher education, but I somehow took it too far, so I had Salt Lake High School and Sergeant Sniper School in the Army under my belt, so we started dating. I don't know why, but she was interested in me. At least that's what she said. In August of 2010 Doris, in her white wedding dress, put my wedding ring on my finger. So when I piled into the clinic to see my Doris, she wasn't there. She'd gone to lunch, nobody knew where she was going. There was no lock on the door to the wing entrance at all. Well, what do you suggest I think about that? What should I do? There was no point in asking my wife directly about her lies. I wanted the truth, not another lie to explain the first. So I pretended that everything was fine but vague suspicions began to eat away at my soul. Analyzing our family and intimate relationships lately I realized a few interesting things. First, our sex life has been in a coma for the past month. Doris was terribly tired at work, she had a headache. She wasn't in the mood, and in fact, she had some kind of thrush. And secondly, this is our new neighbor, Cody Goodman, big guy, former Navy SEAL. Well, that's what he said about himself. Cody rented a little house with a garage across the street from us, and in July, I don't know what July it was, he went around to the neighbors wanting to get to know his new surroundings. He came over to our place. He introduced himself, stood on the porch, and when Dory invited him inside for a cup of coffee, he declined and left. During our brief contact, Cody seemed completely calm and even relaxed. The only thing was he kept twirling his keychain in his left hand fumbling and rubbing the bunch. It gave away his carefully concealed excitement and uncertainty. 
It was then that I saw a similar blue-colored magnetic key I suspected my wife of infidelity. It was bad. It was disgusting, but there was nothing I could do about my suspicions. They were nestled comfortably in my head, and they weren't going anywhere. Something had to be done. This coming Saturday, Doris was going shopping, but her Audi's rear left tire had died for some reason. I offered her my GMC for shopping, and she happily agreed. We exchanged keys. When Doris drove away, I quickly inflated the flat tire and drove down 1200 west to a Navas market. I knew there was a shop there that made copies of keys, including magnetic keys. So I had a copy of the strange key in my hands. There was only one thing left to check. When I arrived home, I called my wife and inquired. Darling, when can I expect you? Not till tonight, Harris. I met Sandra. You remember her? She invited me over, so I'll see you tonight. Don't miss me. I wasn't going to miss you. I had some errands to run. Taking the new key, I crossed the road and knocked on our new neighbor's door. Then I knocked harder. No one was home. Well, the moment of truth. I applied the new key to the lockbox. It chimed, clicked, and the door opened. The world collapsed. All this, I was now telling Doris as a curious episode in my life. Damn it. Harris, you sly snake. I must have looked like an idiot on that trip. Jesus Dory, why like you were a fool in love? You've been so careless about your affair. I can't believe it, but, you know, that's not all let me make some calls. Okay, Dower was surprised, but she nodded in agreement. Then I dialed the chief's home number, Noah, I'm sorry to bother you. It's okay, Harris. What did you want from the old man? Noah, please tell me if the Tristan Wright case is still classified or if it's been declassified. I'll find out. I'll find out. And I'll call you back. All we have to do is wait a little longer. What does this have to do with Tristan? Dory was worried. Let's wait. A couple minutes later, Noah called back. Harris the case has been declassified. Why would you do that? Doris is here to see me, and I want to fill her in on the details. You know, she met with me once and we talked about the story, but I didn't give her the details. Thanks, Noah. You helped me out. I turned to Dory. Well, darling, you're ready to hear a sad story. Only it's a little boring. It's about you and me. Dower said. It's about you and me and Cody Goodman and Tristan Wright. Doris squinted warily. Well, tell me about it. And I did. Our late loving neighbor's real name wasn't Cody at all. His name is Tristan Wright. And he's not a paratrooper. He wasn't even in the army. He's a lone gunman. Last time, eight years ago, he robbed a cash truck from Phoenix to Kansas City. The boys were carrying 450 pounds of dilapidated bills. The collection was handled by Loomis, and they screwed up. Warren money is carried in a regular airplane only in a special compartment. They're escorted by two collectors, Tristan took a ticket on this plane and carried a parachute bag into the cabin. No one asked him anything about his somewhat odd carry-on. Backpack and backpack. The metal detector detected nothing. On the flight to Missouri, Tristan stabbed two armored car collectors. Not because they threatened him or tried to stop him, no. The guys would just get behind him while he was controlling the pilots. Just like that, just like that. He took a plastic knife and stuck it in each of them just to keep them out of the way, one in the throat, one in the eye. Armed with the pistols of the dead collectors, he very competently gave instructions to the pilots and slightly corrected the course of the plane. Then he put on a parachute took four collection bags, strapped them to a special harness, and parachuted out over the Eagle Bluffs conservation area. In all, he took nearly three million dollars, and he was never found. For a half 1,000 acres of old growth forest where the fuck was he to be found? Anyway, he's gone. He's probably got a safe house out there somewhere, 
probably with a car. Or he walked asshole. Now I guess the poor guy must have gotten a little worn out after eight years. He enjoyed robbing and decided to do it again. Except we have federal facial recognition now. He he. And then there's his marvelous robotic portrait with five witnesses. He was meticulous in his preparations. It was important to him to know when I was flying out to Missouri where we have two federal banks, so he controlled me through you. He found out that Brinks was moving money out of Salt Lake, and I'm in charge of getting the money bags from airport to airport. He needed to know the day and time of my flight. He could easily determine the flight number from the terminal schedule. Doris sat there with her mouth open, and I went on. You know Dory, when he was arrested, I asked him, did you have to ruin my marriage over such trivial information? I mean, he could have gotten it some other way. He said, it's more interesting that way. X sat there with a pained look. She sighed convulsively. He did say that. I interrupted. I know what he told you. He was being led by the by, and there were bugs and cameras all over the apartment. They showed me the porno movies they made of you. God. Dory moaned. They saw everything. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. Then she jumped up. You knew in advance that Cody was lying to me and did nothing. How could you? Dor, honey, listen to me. When I found out whose key you had, I got a call that night and was invited into the chief's office. There were three FBI sitting there, and they got me. They asked me what I was doing at the intruder's door. I explained. They didn't believe me, but in the end, I managed to convince them that I wasn't involved in the robbery. That's when they told me all this. I looked at Day with pity. The thing is at that point, everything had already happened. The marriage had broken down and couldn't be repaired. You had become a stranger. I was asked to hold back information not to get hysterical and to hold off on the divorce, which I did at my request. I was shown several pornographic videos starring you and Cody. I know he promised to marry you and take you to the Philippines. But he lied about everything, Dory, everything he told you was a lie. There was a couple of one million or two at stake, and he went for it through mangled fortunes and dead bodies. So you got off easy, he could have killed you in cold blood as an unwanted witness, so we left International Airport at four and had to arrive at Wheeler's Port by half past six. When he got up from his seat in the cabin, the whole group realized that it had begun. I got up to stop him too because access to the back of the plane during the transportation of valuables is forbidden, and this was announced over the selector. Stopping in front of me, Tristan pulled out a plastic dagger and tried to stab me. He didn't know the cabin was packed with FBI agents. Eight men, professional wolfhounds. He was shot in the shoulder. Shot in the shoulder is an understatement. Expansive bullet shattered his joint. I didn't even have to do anything. Doris put her hands over her face, still, she loved the geezer. And it was hard for her to imagine him suffering. I continued, he was handcuffed and given first aid. I asked permission to sit next to him and talk to him, and I was allowed to. That's when he told me that he fucked you for sport, he also said he didn't wanna kill me. He said we, two soldiers could have worked it out. It's a pity he said that we were interrupted. I grinned. Warriors, he wanted to make a deal with me by fucking my wife. He was never in the service, bastard. Harris, you're telling a scary story. Dor said in a trembling voice, it's like I'm in another life. I never thought it could be like this. You can't do that to a man, you can't do that to a woman. I mean, I, I loved him. I okay, now tell me how you killed him. Dory, this is hard. I want the satisfaction of knowing he's dead. Oh my god. What am I saying, Harris? You just destroyed me. I okay. She breathed in and out quickly to calm herself down. Talk to me. I'm listening. I did. He asked to go to the bathroom and I volunteered to go with him. Where would he go from the airplane? Right? So he sat down on the toilet seat and I put my spare browning revolver in his lap. Last argument. I bought it offhand, and it's not registered anywhere. 
I always carried it in a holster on my shin, that day, I just slipped it behind the cuff of my sock, I looked sternly at Dory and asked, or do you realize that I'm telling you now about my crime? And if you go to turn me into the police, I'll recant everything and present it as your fiction, she wiped away her tears. Harrison, I swear on my life, I swear on my mother's health that I won't hurt you, Dor jumped up and rushed to me holding out her arms. Harry Harry, my poor Harry. I pulled away pushing her embrace away. Don't Dor. I'm not poor at all. I'm a fool, I forgot about you. I didn't realize how much you were suffering. Look darling. It's all in the past, don't worry so much. It's good that it happened now, we're young, childless, and still able to find our soulmate in this world. We sat in silence, staring at the tabletop between us. I remembered when I told my wife the news, I'd gotten back from a flight late at night. The alarm clock in the bedroom read 2.14 as I remember it now. I woke my wife up. Doris wake up. We need to talk. Are you crazy, Harry? I'm asleep. I have to get up early tomorrow. Darling, this can't wait. The wife went to the bathroom yawning and scratching. She came back sat on the bed. So darling, what's so super important you wanna tell me? Dor, I know about you and Cody. Doris was not discouraged. She gave a heavy, sad sigh and said, Well, well, you would have found out someday anyway. Harry, I'm going to divorce you. I've fallen in love with someone else, and I'm leaving you. I'm sorry, no, Dory. You can't go to him because I killed him. How the wife gasped with a gun, three wounds incompatible with life, and that's when Dor lost consciousness. I didn't do anything. I felt my wife. She's breathing. She's got a pulse, so it's no big deal. I went to the second bedroom locked myself in there and fell asleep without undressing or making the bed. In the morning, I got up late about 10 o'clock. Doris had already left a lot of her things were gone, and I assumed that she had gone to her parents' house and from there to work. By the evening of the next day, I had finished dividing up our money. I divided everything fairly in half. Our salaries were about the same. I have a little more. So 50-50, it's conscience. Three days later, her parents, Jacques, and Misty Day arrived. They're great guys, and I didn't want to upset them at all. I put a bottle of red wine on the table, some delicacies, and a jug of apricot juice. In short, I tried to be as hospitable as possible. Finally, they came to the main event. Jacques entered. Harris, he began. Our daughter says she's left you, that she can't live with you, that she hates you, but she won't tell us what happened. Maybe you can fill us in. Did you cheat on her, or did you hit her or insulted her in some way? Dad, I said, I didn't do any of those things. Well, thank God, Misty exclaimed, so it can still be fixed, she'll get over it and come back to you. No, Mom. She's not coming back to me, my lawyer's already busy drawing up the divorce agreement. Misty gasped, flailed her arms. Oh my god, what the hell happened to you guys? I shot her lover. She's going through a lot, don't let her get discouraged. Don't let her get discouraged. Jacques is worried. Harris, why did you do it? You'll go to jail. No Jacques. They won't. It was done clean and the father-in-law and mother-in-law left in a state of total confusion. Doris finally died. After I talked to Noah, I felt strange, like I'd lost something important and precious, and after what you told me, I'm in limbo. Our roles have reversed, now you're the good guy, and I'm the bad guy, and I don't know what to do. I shrugged, Dor, you don't have to do anything special, just move on with your life, find a good man get married, have kids, move up the career ladder, it's simple. And then she came out. Harris, let's start over. What do you mean? I was surprised, let's start dating, become friends. I interrupted. Dory, we're not enemies as it is. No, we need to become friends with benefits. Do you understand? 
maybe you will realize the need to become husband and wife again later, I'm sorry, Dor, but I'm not ready for remarriage. So no. The ex is in a hurry. Wait, Harry, don't be in a hurry. Remember, we were good together. Well, think about it, I've already thought about it, darling. Now think about it, why would you want a husband you don't love and who will cheat on you all your life, Doris froze in shock. But 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 why? Why what? What made you think you'd be an unloved husband? I just shrugged my shoulders, I'm not going to lecture her about my feelings. It's not about her. It's that I'm gonna think that. And why would you cheat on me for the rest of my life? Would you want to hurt me as much as I hurt you? No. I don't want to hurt you. I'll cheat on you. Probably because I don't feel obligated to be faithful to you. We were silent for a moment. Then Doris got up to leave. Come with me darling. She put on her coat, hugged me, and said goodbye. I'll think about what you said. I'll try to find the strength to accept your cheating and I'll try to find my way to your heart, and she left. I didn't tell her I was in a close relationship with my widowed neighbor, I mean, hell, Doris knows what she's up to. Right? And Ruby has two kids, and she's in dire financial straits. She's struggling, pulling her boys through, and if I'm not going to marry her yet, I'm not going to leave her to her fate, there's a lot I'd like to do for her. And I gotta tell you Ruby is 10 points ahead of my ex-wife in bed, she's so she's so you know what I mean. So let Doris think all she wants, but it's not gonna get us anywhere.